Michael Dawson joins me to talk about malt in his new book, Mashmaker. This is Beersmith Podcast number 165. This is Beersmith Podcast number 164, and it's early February 2018. Michael Dawson joins me this week to talk about malt and his new book, Mashmaker. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They have a great online learning platform at learn.beerandbrewing.com, where you can take a wide variety of online courses in brewing. They have an offer code BEERSMITH2018, which gives you 20% off when you sign up for any of their online courses. Learn about brewing at learn.beerandbrewing.com. And also the new BrewVision thermometer from Blickman Engineering. This interactive wireless digital thermometer connects right to your iPhone or iPad and lets you remotely monitor and record temperatures. You can download your recipes right from the BeerSmith cloud and set updates and alerts as you brew. Get the BrewVision Bluetooth thermometer today. Another great innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. Dot com. And finally, Beersmith Software, the industry standard for home and professional brewers that lets you design great beer recipes and brew with confidence. Download your free 21-day trial from Beersmith.com today. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Michael Dawson. Michael was the founding member of the Brewing TV team and is an editor of Brew Your Own Magazine. He's a BJCP certified beer judge and writes for Growler Magazine. He just published a new book called Mashmaker, which I have in my hot little hands here. Uh, A Citizen's Brewer Guide to uh, Making Great Beer at Home. Uh, Michael, it's great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me, Brad. It's great to be back. How are things up there in the, uh, let's see, you're in the the St. Paul, Minnesota area, right? Absolutely. Uh, This morning, it's all of one degree out here, so I'm layered up. Uh, But yeah, things are good. Things are good. (laughs) So what have you been up to since I saw you, I think, last time at HomebrewCon, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Like you mentioned, uh, writing a book that that came out uh, in November, so just uh, about three months ago or so. Yeah, this Um, one one here, right? That one, that one there. Yep. Uh, so apart from that, you know, uh, just, uh, spending time with my family, wife and daughter, uh, and, um, trying to ride my bike as much as I can, uh, despite the weather. Lovely, lovely. Um, well, you do have a book out uh, called mash maker and I'm going to hold it up one more time here. There we go. Uh, Mm -hmm. can you tell us a little about the book? Yeah. So like you mentioned, I wrote for, uh, the growler, uh, which is a, a local kind of beer and craft beverage and food publication here in the Twin Cities. Um, and I wrote a homebrew column for them for several years. And um, out of those years worth of columns, we kind of compiled this uh, narrative heavy uh, book of, of beer recipes. Um, you know, I don't know if you've had a chance to flip through it, Brad, but it's got uh, a lot of, of kind of story and, and narrative attached to each recipe. Uh, so yeah, I was looking at it uh, over. There's obviously, you know, at the beginning you have kind of an intro to brewing, but it's fairly short. And then, yeah. um, and then you kind of jump right into the recipes. Yeah. Yeah. it's all, all grain. Um, although, uh, I think there is a cider recipe in there, uh, which would kind of be the, the outlier. Um, but, uh, yeah, otherwise it's all, uh, you know, kind of a mixture of classic styles and, uh, more loosely defined stuff, I guess. Um, there's a sati, um, some kettle sours, some kind of non-traditional stuff as well. And as you mentioned, uh, each of the recipes has a little story attached to it. Yeah. Yeah. I know, no, uh, beer exists in a vacuum. Right. So, uh, I love to give, uh, kind of context and, uh, my, an account of my personal journey with each beer, uh, as much as possible. And, um, feedback on that has been good. So yeah, it's, it's out there in the world now. Well, awesome. Uh, well, we'll talk some more about that, uh, at the end, but today you wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, malts. So I thought maybe we'd start with some of the basic, uh, malt types. There's uh, sure. let's see, base malt. Well, I'll let you go through them. Yeah, so um, how these 
categories would be labeled exactly depends somewhat on the maltster or the manufacturer. But like you mentioned, you know, base malt, um, caramel malts, kilned malts, and roasted malts would would be uh, some pretty pretty generally applicable categories that we could put everything into uh, base malts. Uh, you know, this is going to be remedial for a lot of your listeners, of course, but base malts would include things like uh, pale malt, um, Pilsner malt, Vienna, Munich, um, mild ale malt, things like that. The, the stuff that provides the enzymes and fermentables as well as nutrients for the yeast during fermentation. Um, those can be made from usually what we see these days is two row barley in the craft beer world. But, um, a lot of those can be made from six row barley varieties as well. Caramel malts are, you know, for color, flavor, um, shelf stability, foam stability, things like that. And they're, they're, um, produced with an extra step in the process beyond what, what a base malt would use. Mm -hmm. Kiln malts, uh, things like biscuit, Amber, brown malt, all the way up to chocolate and black malt. Roasted barley are used for color and flavor as well. Uh, and those can, uh, rather than sweetness or fermentable sugars, give uh, some biscuity to chocolatey to kind of acrid, roasty coffee notes. And that's, that's malt. If you, can, uh, you can also, I mentioned barley, but of course, like any cereal grain can be used to make malt. So you'll also find rye and oats and wheat as, as uh, the base grain for malts as well. Sure. Um, can you walk us through the malting process, uh, the basic malting process, and how some of the different malts are made? Because each of the different categories kind of has a, a slightly different approach to the way they're handled, right? Sure. Yeah. So... Um, the the basic process for any malt is going to be uh, steeping, germination, and kilning. The steeping is soaking in water to bring the moisture level of the, the harvested grain kernel up to uh, a certain level that's necessary for germination. That's going to take, uh, you know, roughly 24 to 36 hours. Um, then the next four days basically after the grain is steeped and, and absorbs a bunch of water, uh, it will be allowed to germinate. And that's what activates the enzymes. It starts to break down the, uh, the really high molecular weight proteins and starches in the kernel uh, that'll eventually make it more available for yeast when we actually get around to working with it in the brewery. Um, once the germination has reached a sufficient level for the malt that's to be made, that would be, the, you know, the degree of modification that, that maltsters and brewers refer to. The germination is stopped and the grain is dried out um, in a kiln. And that'll take uh, another 24 to 48 hours, depending on uh, the moisture level after germination, Things like ambient temperature, uh, it's a lot easier uh, in Minnesota, at least, to dry malt uh, in the winter just because the humidity is so low. Um, you can drive off moisture a lot faster uh, when it's cold out and the air is dry than in the summer when it's, when it's warm and humid. So all in all, um, the process for producing a malt uh, is going to take seven or eight days give or take, mm -hmm. of, of pretty, pretty constant attention um, to all those parameters. So at that point, uh, you've got green malt and how, how far it's kilned uh, will kind of determine whether you'd call it a Pilsen, Vienna, Munich, uh, Pale Ale, um, at least in part. That would, that would be a determining factor. Um, so they, from what I understand, they turn the temperature up, right? When at near the end of the process, they turn the temperature up and to make some of the darker uh, kiln malts, right? Yep, yep. There are a lot of uh, kind of process decisions that a maltster will make, um, uh, and the temperature at the at, at during kilning is one of them. Like you mentioned, you know, for a pilsner malt, you'd want something, you'd want a temperature that's very low. Um, you know, in the, uh, I believe 180 
Fahrenheit, something like that. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, it's going to be kind of dependent on the malt and the conditions that it's, it's being dried under. Uh, for uh, a roasted barley or a chocolate malt or something like that, you'd, you'd have the ability to turn the heat much higher than that to get the, the dark color and flavors and, uh, yeah, the, the Right. I mean, they're burnt, they're, they're heated to several, the, several hundred degrees, yeah. I think, something yeah. like that, right, to, yeah. get, to really roast them and uh, yep. almost burn them, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, Colonel Black Malta roasted barley, it's, it's black. It's like a, a roasted coffee bean. It's, it's uh, the, the outside is, is burned. And then uh, crystal malt's somewhat unique. It's made in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, at the end of kilning, uh, to create a caramel malt or a crystal malt, you re-steep the kernels and uh, it's, it's basically a mash that's conducted inside the kernel. Um, the, the enzymes, which you've activated and, uh, and fostered during germination and preserved during that low kilning to produce green malt, those get recruited during uh, the second steeping to uh, sacrifice some of the starches uh, in, in the endosperm. And the malt is then re-kilned. Uh, and those sugars, which were created in that steep, are uh, caramelized. And you get um, all these great aromas and flavors uh, out of the kilning of those, those steeped malts. Um, anything from, uh, you know, very light, like a carahel or a caramel ten, um, with a lot of like honey and pastry kind of flavors all the way up to like a special B type malt or a extra dark crystal with, um, much deeper reddish brown colors and raisiny figgy burnt sugar kind of aromatics and flavors. But during that uh, second steeping, there you kind of bring it up basically the same temperature we mash at, right? And that's what yeah, converts exactly. the sugars, yeah. and then and then like you said, it gets dried out again after that, right? Yep. Yeah. Exactly. It's um, the mechanics will be familiar to any all grain brewer. It's it's um, yeah, it's a mash. It's just conducted without milling the grain. It all is contained within within the husk. Right. You don't have it. It's not sitting in water at that point, although it has been, you know, the, a lot of water has been added to it. But Right. The moisture um, needs to be brought, you know, it's down to, you know, below 10 percent, below 8 percent, probably after the green malt is kilned. And then it needs to be brought back up to around 50 percent moisture again mm -hmm. uh, for that sacrification to take place. Mm -hmm. So that that adds days on to the, the production cycle. And from what I understand, most of the barley grown in the U.S. now uh, is made from just a few barley varieties, right? There aren't that many anymore uh, that are grown, right? You know, it kind of depends on where you go. Um, here in Minnesota and North Dakota, um, there's a fair amount of barley grown, but it's mostly six row. And mm -hmm. most of that is a variety called Tradition. Uh, if you go out west, you'll see, you know, in like Montana, Idaho, Washington, you'll start to see um, more two-row varieties that would be kind of dominated by, uh, you know, um, Harrington, Metcalf, um, get up into Canada, and there's a lot of Copeland uh, barley grown. So mm -hmm. it, it kind of depends. There's There are, I believe, 29 or 30 different barley varieties uh, that are recommended by the AMBA, the American Malting Barley Association. Um, and that's, it's a, that's a trade organization of maltsters and brewers um, whose purpose is to kind of communicate with barley farmers um, what they want to see. So, uh, so is that the 20, you said 29 varieties, is that primarily for beer, beer brewing? I assume, yeah, because obviously barley's oh, yeah. grown for a lot of other things, right? Yeah, a lot of barley, uh, you know, is grown for feed and, and food products, but it's uh, the the parameters that maltsters and brewers need are, are pretty specific. And so mm -hmm. those 29 varieties are um, recognized by AMBA or approved by AMBA as um, 
having the most favorable qualities for, for monsters and brewers, you know, in terms of like protein level extract, um, and other things like resistance to disease and, um, kind of the, the, just like the, the structural integrity of the plant, basically the straw strength sure, sure. and things like that, that are kind of a factor for harvesting and, and bringing it to the malt house in in optimal condition. So one thing that's kind of interesting, I, I was looking at this list a few weeks ago. Um, and it's like, you, like you point out, there's a lot of, uh, Harrington, I think, has been on the list since 1989, so it's a little bit of a war horse. But there's a new variety that was approved by AMBA this year called Propino, which mm -hmm. I don't think has been grown much commercially in the U.S., but it's uh, been used in the U.K. and Ireland for quite a while for uh, making two-row pale malt over there. So that could be uh, a pretty interesting thing to have grown domestically. Um, I understand, though, at one time, a much larger variety of, of barley was grown, uh, particularly in the U.S. and around the world. Um, why did so many of these heritage malts disappear over time? Man, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think it's kind of the story of 20th century agriculture in general, though. Um, you know, not, not just barley varieties. I think, you know, um, I garden a little bit, and I... Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I'm on the mailing list for this company called Seed Savers, which um, has heirloom seeds of, you know, uh, just about any vegetable you could imagine. Um, and there was certainly a lot of genetic and geographic diversity um, from, you know, our grandparents' generation and, and before in things like corn and tomatoes and dill. I've got some crazy... Um, Dutch strain of dill that's just taking over my one corner of my backyard. Um, but a lot of these uh, heirloom plants have just kind of been hybridized um, for the sake of economics, whether, um, like I mentioned, disease resistance is, is kind of a factor in, in what malting barley farmers and, and any farmers really are looking for in a plant disease means uh, reduced yield uh, and, and kind of a poorer quality crop generally. Um, yeah, I know in, in some cases wipe things out. I, I, I can think yeah. of uh, hop farming in New York, which uh, at one time yeah. New York's provided a large, well, a large percentage of the hops used in, in the U.S. and it was even exported to England, but uh, was largely yeah. wiped out by disease, I believe. Absolutely. And it was the same story uh, in the 1860s um, right next to me in Wisconsin, where, uh, you know, it was a, a huge hop farming industry there around the time of the Civil War. Um, and, um, yeah, the I, I think it was, uh, I want to say it was a vitriculum. Ver, uh, I'm not gonna I think, I think that's right, actually. Yeah. But there, there was a disease that just eradicated it. And that's that's certainly the case for a lot of the the older barley varieties. They're they're very susceptible to things like fusarium and ergotic mold, um, which is kind of a, a landmine for the malting process. <laughs> um, and so, as newer varieties um, were bred to uh, have greater resistance to those types of disease, as well as um, you know more favorable processing characteristics like the yeah, and strength I mentioned. Or of course, a lot. Stuff. Yeah. The, the yields have, have improved dramatically too over yeah, what we were yeah. growing probably a hundred years ago. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's, um, why a barley variety like Maris Otter has had so much success for the past 50 years is because, um, it just yielded better than its predecessors. Um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a new hybrid barley variety is easier to work with. Uh, it matures faster. Um, you know, I mentioned Copeland being one that's on my mind because we, we, uh, at work here, we just did, um, a trial with identical recipes brewed with, uh, Pilsner malts made from five different barley varieties. And the Copeland was one that really stood out to me. And that is, uh, an early maturing two row that does awesome, uh, in Alberta. And, you know, kind of the, the Canadian plains where 
the growing season is shorter than it is here in the States. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so if a farmer can plant a a barley that grows faster and matures quicker and yields more, um, bye-bye heirloom. Yeah. (laughs) Well, uh, we're now seeing, though, uh, some of the heritage varieties actually being revived uh, yeah. And grown for craft brewing, many of them by craft maltsters. Can you uh, can you tell us a little bit about that story? Yeah, I mean, God bless the Luddites, right? Um, and their their Dutch dill taking over their backyard. Um, there's it's it's cool to see um, interest in a lot of these uh, varieties being revived, whether it's you know a vegetable in your garden or or a barley. Um, and there's there's a lot of um, work being done to, to bring some of these back. Um, and it's supported by kind of an interest in, in history and, um, terroir, I guess, among the, the, yeah, the to use a, people. use a French term, right. Can you explain that term terroir? Yeah. Um, you know, my, my interpretation of it or my explanation of it would just be the expression of the environment and the growing conditions Right, it's used. Yeah, it's used in winemaking. Is uh, yeah, uh, uses that word all the time. Yeah, it's it's like an expression of the time and place where where uh, a product was grown, uh, organoleptically. So you know, tasting the soil or the weather, uh, the, the the growing conditions, the season, the sunshine. It's very very poetic, um, but. Um, I, I kind of think there's still something to it. Um, you know, the, the it, it, it's the whole nature versus nurture thing, right? Like part of what will make a hop or um, a barley uh, or grape or, or anything like that um, taste the way it does and behave the way it does in the mash tank or the fermenter or whatever Um is genetic, right? Um, Maris otter is going to yield better than uh, your ancient British land race barley. It's going to be more resistant to fusarium wilt. Um, you know, uh, mm-hmm. but if I grow Maris, if grow Maris otter in Minnesota, it's going to be different than uh, than perhaps the one we get from England, right? Well, yeah, exactly, because, uh, you know, we've got a very moderate maritime climate where Maris otter is grown in the UK, and uh, we've got a dry continental climate uh, in, in, you know, places like the central United States and Canada and even, uh, you know, in continental Europe. Um, so the, the, the place where... Uh, a plant is grown is going to affect how it tastes. Mm-hmm. So having said that, like it's, it's still cool to see a lot of these old genetics come back. Um, a couple that I have direct experience with are, are some 19th century barley varieties, um, that Chris malting from England has brought back. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chevalier has been in the States for a little while, uh, Sierra Nevada, um, Goose Island, uh, Gigantic in Portland. Um, I'm just trying to rattle off, off some places that I've brewed with it off the top of my head. Um, but that was kind of, um, the, that was the Maris Otter of England in the 1800s. It was kind of the king of the, of malting barley. Um, and it was, it was actually, um, spun out of a land race is kind of like the the story of amarillo it was found just happened to be growing in a field um and uh it was named for the the i think he was a pastor anglican pastor who owned the land uh reverend chevalier um yeah and the the barley just kind of took took the english brewing world by storm uh but it was eventually phased out uh, in the early 20th century, like we said, because it had been replaced by newer hybrids that yielded even more and had better um, resistance to disease and things like that. But you can uh, you can get that again now, right? You can get that again. Um, it's crisp, it, you said? 
crisp, yeah. And they've done another one called uh, Plumage Archer, which is a cross between an English land race and a Danish barley. And that's that's a pretty cool one, too. Um, Chevalier is... Uh, it's it's different. Like you can tell that it's not a 20th century plant. It's a little earthier. It's a little more rustic tasting. Mm-hmm. Um, you, it's not unrecognizable as an English pale malt, but it's just a little little different. It can take a really high hop load very well. Um, you know, if you read any of the um, kind of contemporary accounts of the hop rates used in, in the early IPAs that were exported. Um, it's, it's a lot of hops and, um, Chevalier kind of has the backbone to stand up to that. It makes a great mild ale as well. Um, does well with, with lower gravities cause it brings in a lot of character, um, just by itself. It's a, it's a cool, cool barley. Plumage Archer is a little more modern to me um it's uh i i kind of want to describe it as like an english vienna malt it's it's fairly pale um clean tasting but it's got this really nice bright biscuity note um i've done mild ales with that um done some some bitters um got friends who've made um some stouts and even like a, a smoked porter with it um, that's, that's also a pretty cool barley. That's a newer, newer variety. That's just kind of hitting the States right now. And, it and, takes, and you've had a chance to brew with both of these, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I speak, I speak from personal experience. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you, you like them, right? I mean, they've come out, come out I nice. Do, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a recipe in the book, in fact, for, a uh, like a single malt barley wine, an English style barley wine with all Chevalier in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah. And like I said, I've got a, I've got a beer, uh, on tap at home right now. Um, that's a plumage archer and target, uh, smash. Um, it's just kind of loosely based on, a, a Scottish, an 18, 1880, I think Scottish 80 shilling from, mm-hmm. uh, Ron Pattinson's books. Um, as yeah, uh, it's you could almost almost mistake it for a pilsner. Um, it's yeah, wow. it's just it's got that bright biscuity, um, uh, sort of reminiscent of a Vienna quality to it. It's it's also a pretty cool malt. And we're also seeing, also starting to see uh, malts uh, that actually reflect the terroir of the uh, area they're grown in, right? Um, yeah. So, how does the uh, growing region affect the flavor? And uh, can you give us a couple examples, maybe, or an example or two? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, you know the the protein level, the uh, the the starch content. Um, an enzyme package of, of a malt, uh, all those things are going to kind of be influenced by, um, where, where it's grown. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess, uh, if I can, if I can use another specific new malt as, as kind of an example, um, Vireman, uh, has, this is not an heirloom variety, but this is like a new, um, a new hybrid that they've developed um, with the intent of growing barley where it's not typically grown. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so, called Eric Clea. Okay. And, um, you know, the, I remember in, in one of Michael Jackson's books, he talks about the barley belt, uh, you know, which is kind of, you know, the Northern United States, Canada, um, kind of, you know, that, that latitude, um, which includes England and, uh, central Europe, um, Southern Europe is, is what would kind of traditionally be the grape belt. Um, wine grapes grew better in, in Southern Europe than barley did. And so those, those cultures developed into winemaking cultures. Uh, but in the interest of just kind of um, I guess 
hedging bets against climate change mm -hmm. and the barley belt possibly moving in the future. Um, Eric Clea was developed to uh, grow in a wine region, basically. So it's it's grown in northeast Italy on the Adriatic coast, uh, which is which is more known for um, white wines, you know, Prosecco and Suave. Um, if I if I'm remembering my yeah, I think Prosecco is correct. Right. Yeah, yeah, um, and so it's it's uh, an arid coastal climate, um, and uh, Ericlea can actually uh, acquire and retain moisture from from the fog that comes in on the Adriatic. Mm -hmm. in the morning. Uh, so, so it does well in this, um, environment that would historically have been pretty averse to, um, to barley and malting, malting barley specifically, but, um, so they're growing a Pilsner in this relatively dry climate, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And in, in this kind of chalky, um, minerally soil, uh, and it makes, uh, this really lovely, delicate, uh, Pilsner malt. It's it's not um, as hearty, I guess, in terms of flavor mm -hmm. as as, as um, you know something that would be grown north of the Alps in Europe or um, you know in, in in the Western U.S. Um, but it it makes a fantastic Kolsch or um, just kind of a nice simple pale lager. Um, so and again, of, you know, this, this, this is the poetry of terroir, but I, I feel like you can kind of get some of that minerality, um, some of that that um, chalky soil and, and maritime fog quality out of it. Mm -hmm. And you have uh, you brewed with this as well, the Ericlea Pilsner from Weirman. I haven't brewed with it at home, but I've okay. used it on the uh, the the RAR Technical Center brewery here across the street from my office. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll I'll count that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a nice, Hey, it's Jay Keeler, everybody. Hey, Jake. <laughs> He's in the back of the video for those of you watching it, listening on the audio, yeah. but go ahead. Um, so, uh, let's go to, uh, <laughs> I believe some of the small malt, malt houses are also experimenting with locally grown malts, right? Uh, we're starting yeah. to see craft malting pop up, uh, all through the Midwest and, uh, Northeast again, right? Yeah, and I, I know there's a few uh, out in the Rockies uh, and and in the Pacific Northwest as well. Again, you know, God God bless the Luddites and uh, feeding that interest in in um, the local and the the terroir and the old school. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them are growing and malting their own uh, their own malts, their own barley, right? Yeah, yeah. So, what are your thoughts on the craft malting trend? Do you think this is going to continue? You know, I, I think that as long as there's a market for it, which there seems to be at the moment, uh, I think um, I think we'll we'll continue to see these places uh, kind of doing their thing and 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 filling their their niches. Um, we saw a similar phenomenon a few start up a few years ago with with small hop farms, mm -hmm. uh, at least here in the Midwest, and I believe there's there's others. Oh yeah, um, they're popping up in the Northeast as yeah. well. Yeah, for sure. And I, I don't think they're going to put Yakima Chief out of business, but they've they've got a local market. We've got 6,000 odd breweries uh, in the United States now, which is just a ridiculous number. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the most ever, so, right? It dwarfs, yeah. dwarfs the number yeah. we had before Prohibition, I believe. Yeah. So, um, there's, there's plenty of demand for, for these raw materials and especially when they have a story attached to them. Um, and, and that helps the brewer and the consumer kind of forge a connection with it somehow. Yeah. Locally grown beer, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have locally grown hops, locally grown uh, malt, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can hook you up with some locally grown dill too, Brad. Dill, okay. Well, that's great. I'll, I'll try. I don't know. Does dill go well in the beer? I haven't tried that yet. I dill use it beer. in pickles. Pickles is probably a better use of the dill, yeah. Um, well, I wanted to spend a few minutes at the end uh, swinging around back to your, your book uh, called Mash Maker, and I was yeah. wondering if, uh, well, let's just, how, how'd you get involved in writing this thing? How'd you decide to write it? 
Um, it was about five or six years ago. Um, the the editorial team at the Growler, which which was um, just kind of a fledgling publication at that point. Um, approached me and asked if I wanted to do a, a monthly column for their their website and then the print magazine. Um, the I said yes, and uh, we we just kind of started doing a recipe a month. Um, sometimes it was tied to a theme. Um, you know, I, I did uh, for an international issue that they did. I did a um, uh, a. Belgian blonde ale with uh, red cargo rice mm-hmm. from Southeast Asia. Um, and I think we used German hops in it too to just kind of like bring it full circle. Um, other times uh, it's just kind of been uh, whatever I felt like. And so we, we did a lot of German lagers and uh, things like that. Those recipes after piling up for, uh, whatever it was, five years, um, we looked at it and said, we should, we should turn these into a book mm-hmm. and, uh, thought, like you mentioned, there's, there's a, a, kind of a gloss on how to and, uh, raw materials at the front of the book, just for the, the sake of completion. We wrote some new recipes. I wrote some new recipes, I should say the Royal we being a, a really great editorial team, uh, and, and, and mm-hmm. illustrators, uh, at the growler. Um, we put together some new, new recipes that had never before been published, uh, to include in the book and, um, went to press, uh, at the end of last summer. And it was, it was released right around Thanksgiving. And 80% of the book is recipes. So I wanted to, um, uh, of course, the, the interesting part to me is the backstories because uh, they each come with about a, I'm trying to remember, page, page, page and a half of a backstory with them. Yeah. Uh, can you share a couple of the stories here maybe between, uh, maybe a couple out of a couple of your recipes? Sure. Yeah. So um, the to, to, to celebrate the launch of the book, we, we worked with a brewery here in St. Paul, Bad Weather Brewing Company, uh, to do one of the recipes. And we did it because the book was released uh, right before Thanksgiving. We did it on Black Friday. It's a black IPA. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the name of the beer is called Neck Tat that says evil. <laughs> nice. Evil Black Friday, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It was very, very Scandinavian death metal. Um, <laughs> the story behind this beer is... Um, a while ago, I was I was traveling uh, for work to go to a brewing conference, and on the way, I'm going to change names to protect the innocent here, but um, or omit names to protect the innocent, I should say. Um, on the way, I we won't mention brewing. we won't mention Jake, right? Who? Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Um, on the way, uh, we stopped at a brewery that had just won a medal at GABF for what I believe in that arena of competition, they call American black ale. They don't get into the whole black IPA Cascadian dark, uh, fracas. Um, it was a, a gold medal winning beer at GABF. Really, really tasty. Um, hung out at this, this brewery for a while and then continued on to, uh, where, where the conference was being held. Um, and during one of the seminars, uh, I sat next to a guy who had a neck tattoo and, um, because I'm, uh, just a pasty faced, you know, shy, introverted Midwesterner. I didn't want to make eye contact with somebody who had a neck tattoo. I mean, he might have been from prison. He might be into drugs. He might kill me. I'm pretty sure that the neck tattoo said evil. Nice. I can't confirm that with a hundred percent certainty, but, I hate to let truth get in the way of a good story. So I just told myself that neck tattoo says evil. And I sat next to this guy who's probably a mass murderer. I'm sure he's not. Um, (laughs) I'm sure the neck tattoo didn't say evil either, but I didn't read it and it's made a great story. So it's probably Dr. Evil, right? Probably, probably was. Yeah. It's probably his family name. That makes a lot of sense or his child, little evil Johnson. Um, anyway, I, uh, 
I had that beer again at the conference shortly after uh, sitting next to the guy with the neck tattoo. And uh, I said, I should, I should try to do a beer like this when I get back home. That, uh, that recipe got printed uh, in, in a future edition of the Growler. And uh, that, was, that was kind of the, the launch party for, uh, for the book. Uh, we did 10 barrels of it at bad weather and, um, home brewers, uh, could, who would, who'd signed up and RSVP could come in and take five gallons of the word home and, uh, ferment it. And nice. so, yeah, I've had a lager version of it that somebody did. I've had, um, a version with extra dry hops. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, all, all the, all the recipes are presented, um, with, with tweaks and variations. I don't assume that anything, uh, will be done exactly to spec in the book. I, I encourage aftermarket modifications. Nice. Well, maybe, uh, one more quick story if you got time. Yeah. Um, trying to think of another good one here. Um, my wife and I like to play games and trash talk. Um, and, uh, I, I was on a really bad losing streak of, uh, of bocce, uh, in our backyard. Uh, I, I'd just been getting spanked by her mercilessly. My ego was taking a bruising for all, from all the trash talking I was receiving. Um, and I decided that I needed an equalizer in the form of a beer. And so I, 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 I did, a, a cream ale, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, particularly strong beer or anything like that, but it was just extremely crushable, uh, mm -hmm. in the hopes that she would over consume and this would adversely affect her, her bocce game. Her bocce skills. Yes. Yeah. It ended up backfiring on me. Mm. But I figured, you know, I mean, that still kind of validated my approach. Uh, and so that recipe got turned into a, uh, into a, uh, a recipe or into a, into a column as well. And then eventually into the book, uh, that's, that's called bocce swerve cream ale. Um, yeah. yeah I, would, I, I enjoy a good game of bocce. I mean, you know, I, yeah, I, if you ever come back to Minnesota when it's not one degree out, I'll let you play my wife. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, what are some of your takeaways from, uh, from finishing your first book? Um, you know, it, it, it took longer than I thought. Um, but I enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, it's, it's, I'm really, really proud of the finished product and I'm, I'm happy to be able to say I've done it. It definitely helps to have a good editor. So I want to thank, uh, John Garland and, and the rest of the team at the growler for all their work on it. Um, yeah, it's, it's available at mashmakerbook.com. Mm -hmm. I've got the website up here for yeah. those of you on the video. Yeah. Yeah. Mashmakerbook.com. It also comes up if you just Google mashmaker actually. First. Oh, that's the that's very good. first. Yeah. Very first entry, I think. SEO. So, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, well, Michael, I wanted to thank you again for, for agreeing to come on the show. It's uh, been great having you here. Thanks for having me, Brad. It's nice to be back. And uh, again, today my guest was Michael Dawson. Michael's a BJCP beer judge, uh, avid brewer, and author of the new book, uh, which I'll hold up here, called uh, Mash Maker. And I'll, I'll throw the website up there, too. Thank you again, Michael. Appreciate you being here. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, everybody. Well, a big thank you to Michael Dawson for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Their educational program lets you learn about every aspect of brewing in detail. Take advantage of their fantastic sale and get 20% off any of their courses when you use the offer code BEERSMITH2018 at learn.beerandbrewing.com. And also Blickman Engineering, creators of the innovative new BrewVision wireless thermometer. Remotely monitor your brewing system from your iPhone or iPad, record data, set alerts, and grab recipes directly from the BeerSmith cloud. The BrewVision Thermometer, another great innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, BeerSmith Mobile. The mobile version of BeerSmith is a perfect complement to our desktop brewing software. Check out BeerSmith Mobile at BeerSmith.com mobile 
or on the Google Play, iTunes, or Amazon app stores. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Thank you.